Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today we continue our look at Joseph's journey, focusing on his wrongful accusation and imprisonment. The scripture we'll be studying is found in Genesis chapter 39 and 40. The Life Notes are ready for download from calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of Genesis, chapters 39 and 40. And uh, I'll just move this myself because I can. And, uh, you know, sometimes they do that just so I'll remember that I'm a servant. Uh, you know, it's so nice to uh, have people who usually do that, and I'm sure they just simply forgot, and uh, now I'll have something to laugh about with them afterwards. But uh, could have picked it up and carried it, but I didn't want to show off and be out of breath. Uh, so, <laughs> hey, if you, would take, if you would take your Bible and turn to uh, uh, Genesis 39 is our text. We're going to be looking at verses, uh, chapters 39 and 40. And if you are in the room of any of our campuses, at Sweetwater Campus or at our Parker Campus, and you don't have a Bible with you, that is perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 39, and you will be there with our text. And as always, at any of our campuses, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, please take one with you. It is our gift to you. And uh, if you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, please message us. We'd be happy to get you a Bible, whether we mail it to you or deliver it to you, because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, in just a moment, we're going to pick up in uh, the story of Joseph, Pit to Palace. Uh, but before we do, uh, I want to share a couple of things with you. First one, do you guys like the good news first or the bad news first? Yeah. I'm always a bad news first person because I want to end on a high note. And this isn't bad news, but it is. Uh, so you guys also know that uh, Calvary doesn't really do politics. We're not really immersed in politics. But every now and then, politics infringes itself uh, with uh, dealing with biblical subjects and demands that we uh, address them. And if, uh, if you're a voter in Arizona this year, there, there's about 100 propositions on the you know, ballot. Did you guys get the encyclopedia that came to express all that? Yeah, I read through that. And there is a tragically evil proposition uh, that I want to speak to just for a moment. It's Proposition 139, and it is a pro-death, pro-abortion proposition that if, if you vote yes on that, if it passes in our state, then uh, mothers will be allowed to kill their children up to the point of birth. And uh, look, Arizona already allows abortion up to 15 weeks. It allows exceptions in the cases where a, a mother's life is in danger uh, or rape and incest. So, so you know, there, there's our, we're, you know, like the rest of the country, we're already a culture of death anyway. But this is like taking it a step further. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm just going to say, uh, because our biblical values are pro-life, because they are pro-family, because, uh, you know, we want to try to align that. Th this is uh, confronting the, those of us who are followers of Christ. And I just want to encourage you, please vote no on Prop 139. Uh, okay? <laughs> now, if you are a, a woman who has been uh, uh, broken by abortion... You know, that's part of your story, and you've been carrying guilt or shame uh, because of that. You're, 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 just, you're not whole because of that. Uh, number one, there is grace in Jesus Christ. And number two, we've got a healing ministry called Forgiven and Set Free, which is a study group made up of women who have gone through the tragedy of abortion and have found freedom and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And they are starting this week. And they would love to invite you to come and be a part of that. You can sign up online. Uh, you can find uh, uh, details out if you go to calvaryaz.com. Uh, but if that is you and you would like to find uh, forgiveness and freedom, then I would encourage you to, to check out that study, Forgiven and Set Free, uh, because it is worth it for your healing and for your hope. Um, now, 
you know, I said bad news and good news. So the good news is I'm going to talk about Limitless just for a second. I'll give you guys an update on where we stand. Numbers are in your bulletin. If you check those out every week like I do, uh, don't bother. We update them once a month. Uh, so, uh, but you don't know exactly when that update is, so you check them out. Hey, I just want you to know that we, uh, last, last month when I shared, we were about $900,000. Well, now we are over a million dollars. We're actually at $1.3 million. And, uh, and that means a couple of things. Number one, our Parker Campus uh, remodel has been completely paid off, uh, and we celebrate that. Let me hear you and Parker celebrate that, too. Uh, but uh, this coming summer, June 2025, we're going to uh, break ground in here in the Sweetwater uh, campus. We're going to add a mezzanine, a balcony, right back there across the back. And uh, we're raising the money so we can pay cash for that. And just to be honest with you, we need about $600,000 more uh, to, for that to, to cover the mezzanine and the extra parking we're going to add and all the other upgrades we're going to do in the process. So I'm just reminding you, hey, if you made a commitment, thank you for, for giving faithfully because right now we're, uh, we're on schedule, like I said, to be able to pay cash for that mezzanine as, uh, as we build it and hopefully have the cash on hand before we build it, and then, uh, then we'll start saving up money for next uh, along the way. So uh, I just wanted to share that update and say thank you for being faithful because our God is limitless, and we are raising the money to continue leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So saying that, have you ever had a bad day? <laughs> right? I mean, we have all had bad days, right? I mean, but I mean like a really bad day, not like a bad day on the golf course or a bad day I got a flat tire or a bad day the kids got the stomach virus and they're puking all over the house. I mean, those are, those are bad days, but they're really just normal life days, right? I'm talking about plans shattered, life altered, never going back kind of days. You've had those, haven't you? But have you had a bad month, and a bad year, and a bad decade? Because if you had a bad decade, now you're in the class of Joseph, who we're talking about. Uh, see, we're continuing to look at the story of Old Testament Joseph, and if you don't know the difference between the Josephs, uh, listen to last week's sermon. Uh, but last week, we talked about his dysfunctional family. Remember, it was a blended family. He had 10 older half-brothers. There was a lot of family favoritism and pride and arrogance. And, and Joseph's brothers, and they were going to kill him. But then they, you know, decided to be good guys and just sell him into slavery. They made some money on it, too. So today, we're picking up with Joseph's story of slavery and imprisonment. Okay, Joseph's story of slavery, we're continuing because, I just want to tell you, you can read it, the, the entirety of what I'm sharing in, in chapters 39 and 40 of Genesis, so uh, I hope you'll you know, go home and read that, but I don't just want to read it to you. Let me just tell you uh, in a summary what happened. So Joseph got to Egypt, the Ishmaelites sold Joseph to a man named Potiphar, and Potiphar was the captain of Pharaoh's guard. And, and so uh, Joseph becomes a slave in Potiphar's house. And, and yet, because God was with Joseph and because Joseph uh, was obedient to God, God blessed Joseph as a slave. And so he rose the ranks of slaves. I don't know what the ranks of slaves are. Okay, never been one, never been there. But eventually, it, you know, Potiphar noticed that everything that Joseph did was blessed. And so eventually, I don't, we don't know if that's months, years, what, he put Joseph in charge of all the other slaves. Uh, and so he was like running the house. He was running the finances. He was running the yard. He was running the work, whatever the fields were going on. He was the guy over all of it. And, and, uh, and that was, and God was blessing. And Potiphar's like, I don't have to worry about anything except the food I eat and serving Pharaoh. So, I mean, that's what God was doing in Joseph's life. And Mrs. Potiphar, um, being the bored housewife that she was, uh, looked at Joseph and thought, he's cute. And she started hitting on Joseph. She started going, hey, why don't you come sleep with me? Hey, come on. You know, nobody will know. Hey, come on. And, and Joseph just said no, repeatedly. For a long period of time, he continually rejected her and said, I can't do that. And, and one day, nobody else was around, and she grabbed his clothes and said, lie with me. And he ran out of there, and she had his cloak, and she decided to cry rape. And 
Potiphar came home and she gave him her story about how he tried to force himself on her and she screamed and he ran away and left his cloak and Potiphar was enraged and so he took Joseph and put him in Pharaoh's dungeon. So he was a slave, but he was a slave who was living pretty well and then it all got shattered because he was falsely accused and now he is in prison but God was still with him. And, and so he's in prison and he's there for a long period of time. In fact, he's there long enough that he rises the ranks of prisoners and, and the head of the dungeon sees him and sees that God is with him. And so he, he, go, he starts promoting Joseph until Joseph is running the prison. Now he's an inmate, but he's running the prison. The guard that's in charge just keeps him locked in and, and Joseph makes all the decisions about all the prisoners and everything and God blesses Joseph in prison. And then a couple of guys who are Pharaoh's uh, trusted people get sent to prison. They did something to make Pharaoh mad and he sent his chief bearer, uh, cup bearer and his chief baker into prison. And he left them there and the Bible just says for some time. Wasn't quick, wasn't like a day or two or a week. It was some period of time. And, and, uh, and of course Joseph is taking care of them as well as all the other prisoners because he's the guy in charge. And, uh, and then they have a dream. The baker and the cupbearer have dreams and it bothers them and Joseph says, what's up? And they tell him the dreams and Joseph interprets the dreams. He tells the cupbearer, hey, in three days you're gonna be reestablished as the cupbearer. And the baker goes, hey, that's not a good, interpret my dream. And he says, in three days you're gonna get out of here but then the Pharaoh's gonna cut your head off. Congratulations. <laughs> no, I mean, and, and all he says to the, uh, to the cupbearer is remember me when you get out. And so it all happens like Joseph said. The baker gets, you know, killed. He gets executed. The, the cupbearer gets uh, returned to his place of honor and promptly forgets Joseph for two more years. Two years. By this time, slavery and imprisonment has probably been, you know, 10 years plus in Joseph's life. Okay? He, for a decade. He's had a bad decade. And then a couple of years later, Pharaoh has a dream that nobody, nobody among all of his court, among all of his wise men, among all of his advisors, nobody can interpret. And as he's frustrated, the cupbearer goes, oh yeah, there was this guy in prison. He could interpret dreams. And Pharaoh is desperate. And so he sends for Joseph and Joseph is brought out of prison and of course they have to clean him up because he's been a prisoner for a long time. And they bring him to Pharaoh and Pharaoh tells him a dream and, and Joseph tells him the interpretation and then is promoted to the second most powerful person in Egypt. There's from pit to palace, okay? Now that's a quick summary of that decade of disaster in Joseph's life. Now there's three things that stand out in this story. I just want you to see these in, in Joseph's story. First was, Joseph was blessed by God. Joseph was blessed by God. I mean, he became the lead servant for Potiphar. I don't know, is that the boss servant? Can you be a boss servant? I don't know. He was. So as a slave, his life was blessed and all the people around him were blessed. In prison, Joseph was the lead prisoner. Does that make him the dungeon master? <laughs> That's just for my D&D &D friends. Uh, anyway, uh, but all the prisoners were blessed because of Joseph. So Joseph was blessed by God everywhere he went. And then we see in this that Joseph was obedient to God. So not only was he blessed by God, but he was obedient to God. Specifically, we see this in his interaction with Mrs. Potiphar. And I want you to, I want you to hear this. So in chapter 39, I want to pick up in the second half of verse 6. It says, Now Joseph was, a handsome, was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. Okay, Joseph was obedient to God. I mean, I, did you notice that? She offered herself day after day after day after day. 
And day after day, Joseph refused. And he says, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God and sin against my master? So Joseph chose to be obedient to God, even when he is tempted to not be obedient. And then Joseph suffered false accusation and was forgotten in prison. Joseph, he, he, look, he was blessed by God, he was obedient to God, and he still suffered false accusation and was forgotten. Potiphar's wife accused Joseph of attempted rape, and even though he'd been honorable, he was sent to prison to the dungeon. Okay, then Joseph interpreted the dream of the cupbearer. Only request was to be remembered. That's chapter 40, verse 14. And then uh, it tells us in chapter 40, verse 21, uh, Pharaoh restored the chief cupbearer to his position and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Now, Joseph was faithful he was obedient, he was blessed, and yet he was still wrongly imprisoned and forgotten. Now, the story isn't over, but let's pause and see some lessons from Joseph's journey. This is Joseph's journey from Pit to Palace, but again, the, the reason that God put these stories in the Bible was number one, because they're true, they're history. Okay, this happened. May have happened, uh, you know, 3,600 years ago, but it happened. And so it's true, but it's also in there to teach us. We can learn from the people that God used to build his kingdom. So, number one, first lesson I want you to see from Joseph's journey is we can faithfully follow Jesus and still suffer. We can faithfully follow Jesus and still suffer. Now, this isn't popular, and lots of churches teach or imply the opposite. And lots of Christians wrongly think, hey, if I'm faithfully following Jesus and I'm trying to serve Jesus and I'm trying to honor Jesus with my life, then God's gonna protect me and my family from harm. Okay, now, nowhere in scripture does it say that. In fact, it says the opposite, but there's a lot of us that want to believe if I'm doing it God's way, then nothing bad's going to happen. And that isn't what the life of Joseph shows us and that is not what the teachings of scripture tell us. So the example of, of Joseph demonstrates that godly people can suffer injustices, godly people can be forgotten, godly people can be wrongly accused. And the, and the New Testament reinforces this truth, and in effect, arguing that faithfully following Jesus will not just, you know, not protect you from harm, but will result in suffering. It's not like, you know, you're not going to have any problems or anything. It just means, no, you're going to have problems. It's, it's going to hurt. There's, it's going to be pain. So listen to Jesus, because, you know, he's kind of important to us, right? Okay, John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. Jesus said, if the world hates you, he's talking to who? His disciples, right? If you're a follower of Jesus, guess what? He's talking to you. If the world hates you, Know that it has hated me before it hated you. And if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Yeah. Everybody's excited about that, I can see. That's Jesus. How about the Apostle Paul? Philippians 1.29, he says, for it has been granted to you. You know, when something's been granted to you, usually you kind of see that as a privilege, Right? It's a privilege. So it's, it's, it's been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Wait, let me get this right. Paul says it's a privilege to suffer for the sake of Jesus. Oh, I didn't consider it that. Okay, 2 Timothy 3.12, the Apostle Paul, again, because he likes to be blunt, he says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be free from pain and suffering and loss. No, he says you will suffer pain and loss and hurt because you're gonna be persecuted. Again, going back to Jesus, as he's ending the Beatitudes, you know, we love the Beatitudes. They're so beautiful until we get to the last one, right? Verse 10, Matthew 5. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus goes on. Blessed are you when others revile you 
and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. Is that what you do when you are slandered? Is that what you do when people like start saying nasty things about you online? Do you throw a party? Rejoice and be, no, Jesus says, look, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know what Jesus is saying? He's saying, hey, if, if they're mean and ugly to you, good job. <laughs> now, he does qualify it. If they're mean and ugly to you because you love Jesus, good job. If they're mean and ugly to you because you're a jerk, bad job. Because uh, you can't represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. So our expectations should be built on the words of Jesus, on the words of the apostles and the examples that are set before us like Joseph not our hopes of escaping pain. Let me say that again. We should put our expectations of life on the words of our Savior and of the Word of God and the examples in the Word of God, not on our hope of just escaping the stuff that hurts. That's not realistic. That's not following Jesus. That's not what he said. By the way, uh, as we preach this, millions of Christians are being persecuted around the world. Okay, most of Christendom has to face what Jesus is talking about, has to face what Joseph went through. So let's not gripe and complain or moan about the perceived slights aimed at us by an unbelieving world around us. Please realize that we can all faithfully follow Jesus and still experience suffering, injustice, and attack. Okay, you guys got that? Okay, we can faithfully follow Jesus and still suffer. And number two, we can feel forgotten by God. We can feel forgotten by God. Joseph felt forgotten in prison for over two years, right? Hey, I interpreted your dream. Just do me one favor. Remember me. Oh yeah, I forgot. Like, I can relate to the cupbearer because I forget everything that Morelda asked me to do. Okay. Anybody else ever forget what your spouse asked you to do? Yes, okay. So yeah, I mean, we just, we do. Look, there's a lot of wives that didn't raise your hands. I just, uh, I'm offended, okay? Because you guys know that you forget too. You just pretend like we didn't tell you, okay? So I'm just saying. Look, Joseph felt forgotten. King David felt forgotten by God. If you ever, look, if you're having a bad day, read the Psalms. You will find company there, okay? This is Psalm 77. David writes, uh, just at the beginning, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids opened. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. He's having a bad day. Right? You guys have felt like that sometimes, haven't you? Yeah, Psalm 77. Mark it down. It's a great one to read when you're like broken. How about Psalm 13? Again, David, he says in verse 1, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Light up my eyes lest I die. Sleep the sleep of death. And of course, Jesus, our Savior, felt forgotten by his Father. Because on the cross, he cried out what? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt forsaken. It is not wrong to feel forgotten, to ask how long, or to wonder, God, what are you doing? Uh, by the way, I just need to tell you that Psalm 22, which Jesus is quoting when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because that's how it starts. You gotta read Psalm 22. Ends with praise and a declaration of faith in God because God is gonna deliver him. Psalm 77, the one where uh, I, I read beginning, it, it, again, in the middle of it, 
David affirms God's greatness and remembers what God has done. He says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. He remembers. So look, let me, here's the thing. If you're feeling forgotten, if you're feeling forsaken, just do these two things. First of all, remember what God has done. Remember what God has done. Remember what he's done in your life, how he's redeemed your life, how he's saved your life, how he's forgiven your sins, how he sent Jesus to die on the cross to save you from hell, Amen. to give you life eternal. Remember the promise that is before us. So remember the mighty deeds of God, what he has done. And then just recite the promises of God because he is with us, which means he is with you. Joshua chapter one. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Verse nine, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You can feel forsaken but it's not true. You can feel forgotten, but you're not. Hebrews 13, verse five says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So just please understand this. We all can feel forgotten by God, but, but get this. God can bless us where we don't want to be. God can bless you where you don't want to be, right? Joseph was a slave. Did Joseph want to be a slave? No, no but God blessed him. Joseph was in prison. Do you think Joseph aspired to be in prison? Some of you aren't sure. You're like, I'm not answering out loud. I mean, no, he didn't. He didn't want to be in prison. I mean, he was pleading his innocence, and yet it didn't matter. He ended up unjustly put in prison. That is not his goal, and yet he was blessed where he was. Can I just tell you that God can bless you where you are if you'll be like Joseph and be faithful and be obedient? Amen. It doesn't, it, look, God can bless you if you're unemployed. God can bless you if you're going through cancer. God can bless you if you're divorced. God can bless you if you've messed up so bad in the past you don't want anyone to know about it. God can bless you and redeem you and restore you and heal you and use your life for his kingdom. Amen. Okay, he can do that. He can even bless you if he moves you to South Georgia. So, uh, <laughs> sorry, I had to throw that in. You see, Joseph wasn't where he wanted to be, and yet God blessed him greatly because Joseph honored God. So if we live in the character of Jesus, God will bless us no matter where we are or what we're going through. So please don't compromise. You know, when things are bad is when we're always tempted to compromise. There's always a shortcut. We've got to fix this. We've got to, you know, figure out a way to get around this. Got to manage this. Got to do that. Just don't compromise. Compromise is the enemy of your character. We want to be like Joseph. We want to be faithful and obedient no matter what. You, know, you realize Joseph's story is ruined if he compromises. Right? If he decides, ah, eh, Potiphar's never going to find out. No. We don't, we don't have that. We don't have that. Our lives are damaged when we compromise the character of Jesus. And, and by the way, it's not only Joseph. We, we can all live the story. We can represent Jesus even when we aren't where we want to be. And I got a great example of that. It's Cooper's family. If you don't know this story, it's a great one. Watch this. Cooper is a spark. He's a ball of energy, and he just lights up any room. In 2021, in April, he started having leg pains that we at first thought were growing pains, maybe. Kept progressing, getting worse, to the point where he's limping, and we just couldn't figure out what was wrong. On August 5th, we went in that morning for an MRI. My mom had traveled with me because it was all the way out in Phoenix. We were actually on our way back home to Havasu. I got a call from the neurologist urging us to get back to the ER right away because they found an eight centimeter mass on the bottom of his spine that was compressing on the nerves. So like, 
they described it to me, it's like the size of a peach, like a softball. And he was only five, and that takes up like a quarter of his back. My mom took over driving. I was in the back seat with Cooper, calling my husband. We never thought it would be cancer. And when she called me and told me that, everything kind of just stopped. I just couldn't think. By five o'clock that evening, he was getting prepped for surgery. When they first said mass and tumor, like all, the, all those big scary words, you're just like, why? Why him? Like he's, he loves God so much. Like in my heart, I felt like he was gonna make it, but at the same time, you never know with this stuff. And just as quickly as it popped up, like, some, even though they say treatable, that doesn't mean it's gonna work out that way. He had the surgeries, he had a biopsy, he had a ton of more scans, he got a port placed in, he started chemo. I mean, everything was just going so fast, so fast, so fast. Were you scared? Yes, because I had to do some, um, like, uh, needles. One time I had to do like a poppy needle that hurts very bad. And it's kind of wet. There was one point halfway through radiation where I was at a low point. Cooper, a day or two before, had been um, asking me, you know, why don't I have any hair on my head? Why don't I have any eyelashes anymore? And I was at a pretty low point and then we were walking into radiation that day and a gentleman that I don't even know his name and Cooper would always have his guitar on his back, his little Spider-Man they'd be carrying, smiling, all happy, ready to go in the morning. And on this particular day, we're walking in and this guy's walking out and he was like, Cooper, can I get a picture with you? I am so happy I ran into you. I was feeling so bad for myself. I'm going to chemotherapy right now after my radiation. And I was just so down. And But seeing you, I, I can do this. Like, I can go fight now and everything. And I just, it was what I needed that day. God had a plan. He knew that we were going to get through this together, and Cooper was going to be stronger for it. And then on Mother's Day weekend, he got to ring his bell, that he had nothing, nothing left. That was really cool. I don't know if I can top that one, but... <laughs> and ever since then, his energy has been off the charts. I can't keep up with him anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I knew that God was going to take care of me no matter what, and that I would do good. Amazing, actually. I did amazing. Sometimes our biggest lessons come through the hardest points, the struggling. You can struggle, but you can still have joy. And I think that was the biggest lesson that Cooper could teach anybody, is that no matter what, you could still have joy. You know, um, here's the thing. We have freedom in Jesus. We have freedom in Jesus, and it's time to leave your prison. Uh, Jesus said it was for freedom. Uh, if uh, the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. So Joseph was finally set free. The cupbearer remembered him and his ability to interpret dreams, and, and he said, hey, there's this guy, and then Pharaoh brought him in there, and he interpreted Pharaoh's dream, and Pharaoh went, oh, that's brilliant, and there's, I need somebody to run this country. You're the guy. It, it was like the in, most incredible rags to riches story. But our story is just as dramatic and miraculous. Okay, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were destined for hell and God sent his one and only son to rescue us, to forgive us, to save us and now we are forgiven of our sins. We're adopted into God's family and heaven is our future. We are inhabited by the Holy Spirit who gives us the power to live today for Jesus. So let me just say this, it's time to leave your prison. 
It's time to leave your prison. It's not a prison that's been forced upon you if you're a follower of Christ. If you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus, then understand it is, this is, you're not living in a prison that is forced upon you. It is a prison of your own design. And maybe it's a prison of fear. You just heard Cooper's story. And by the way, two, two years clean and he is healthy as a horse. Okay? And maybe, maybe it's a prison of addiction. Maybe it's a prison of self-destruction or self-loathing. Maybe it's a prison of victim status and, and enabling and codependency. Maybe it's a prison of pride or greed or gambling or food or pornography or materialism. And maybe you are comfortable in your prison. Maybe the routine, the consistency, the familiarity of your situation just makes it hard to leave. And you've convinced yourself that this is the best you can do. Can I just tell you that you can't follow Jesus and stay in prison? Paul said it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. You see, Joseph got out of prison. He was invited out of prison. He went out of prison. He stepped into this new role and he led uh, Egypt. And you'll hear more the rest of the story next week. You'll finish the story next week. But he did that. And, and you and I are called to freedom and our hearts yearn for freedom. And Jesus has set us free. Are you going to join him in that freedom? Okay, but it begins with surrender. Now, a lot of you have already made that commitment to surrender to Jesus. But there's some of you in this room that haven't yet decided Jesus is your Savior and you're going to follow him. You're going to surrender everything to him. And I'm just going to invite you to do that tonight. I'm going to invite you to do that today. I'm going to invite you to do that this weekend. Uh, just make a decision that Jesus is your Savior and you're going to give up your life for him. He will give you eternal life. He will forgive your sins. He will give you a new life. And, and, and it's not, everything's not going to be perfect because I already talked about suffering. I already talked about obstacles. You had a beautiful Christian family or their child went through cancer. And praise God, Cooper lived, but they all don't. You see, we have to decide if Jesus is Lord, are we gonna surrender to him? Now, if you know that Jesus is your, by the way, if, if you wanna make that decision tonight, we got a prayer team that's gonna be here at the front. Pastor's gonna be out in the foyer. Uh, at least if you do nothing else, fill out a connect card so we can call you and talk to you about this. But can I just say, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you've surrendered, but you gotta walk out of that prison. You gotta walk out of that prison and you gotta surrender to Jesus every single day. And if you're sitting here as a follower of Jesus and you know you're trapped in your prison and you don't know how to get out, can I just invite you to come to Celebrate Recovery Monday night at 6.30 at, McC at St. Sweetwater's Auditorium, where we are? Okay, Parker, it's coming soon, okay? So just hang on. But... Look, it's a path, to, it's a journey to freedom and you gotta take that, you gotta take those steps. And, and, and we're not, we don't, we don't have any magic that's gonna suddenly make your problems go away. You know what we are? You know what Celebrate Recovery is? You know what Calvary is? We're like your friend with a pickup truck. We will help you move. We'll only if you wanna go to freedom. We will help you move to freedom, but you've gotta ask for the help. You got to say, I need some help. Come and help me get free. Because God took Joseph from the pit to the palace. God set Joseph free and established him in a new, uh, incredible life. And he can do the same for you. He will take you great places if you'll trust him and if you'll follow him. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for setting us free. Thank you for giving Jesus to be the sacrifice for our sins. Thank you for your redemption in our lives. We want to live for you. Lord, I pray for those that, that maybe are here and don't know you, that they would surrender today, that they would start that journey today so that you can set them free. But, but Lord, I also pray for many who are already your followers who are still trapped in prisons of their own design. God, give them the courage to ask for help. Give them the courage to, to take a step in faith, to confess their struggles, 
to show up at Celebrate Recovery, to go to a counselor, to meet with a pastor. Lord, give, give us the courage to take a step towards you because you're always leading us to life and hope and freedom. So Lord, our prayer is that we would follow you in Jesus' name, amen. We can faithfully follow Jesus, yet still suffer. And sometimes we feel forgotten by God, but we have freedom in Jesus. Thank you for listening to our message today. I invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel by visiting youtube.com forward slash Calvary LHC and hitting the subscribe button. That way you'll be notified whenever we have new content and you'll receive our daily devotionals known as Your Word for the Day. You can also sign up on our homepage at calvaryaz.com. Well, that's all for today. Please join us again next week. Bye-bye. Are you looking for a way to dive deeper into scripture and make it a part of your daily routine? Check out Calvary's Word for the Day daily devotional videos. Visit calvaryaz.com forward slash D-E-V-O and sign up to receive these three to five minute devotionals right to your inbox each day. Our team of pastors and leaders share meaningful insights from the Bible to equip and encourage you in your faith journey. Don't miss out on this opportunity to grow in your relationship with God and connect with the community of believers. Sign up today and start receiving your daily dose of scripture.